come on. Give me a clear. I don't want to be like this big round head. And you could barely see. No, it's fine. You look great. You look great. I, you know, I have not seen you in so long. And it's just great. It's so great to see that you are doing so well um, in your career. It really yeah. is. That's not a surprise at all, but just really great to see how well you're doing. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm trying, that's for sure, to uh, to continue and, 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 and keep things moving. So... Well, we are here today, uh, since the recording has begun, we're here today with Mr. Ricardo Asmando Francis. He's a visual artist and curator. I want to thank you, Ricardo, for taking the time to join me today in this larger project about the importance of Black art, Black artists, and arts education as a social justice issue. I'm going to begin with you, as I have with each of the other artists with whom I've spoken, and just talk, ask you how you were introduced to the arts. What did your formative exposure and uh, formative education look like? Um, I feel like my first interest in art was through uh, comic books, actually. Uh, oddly enough, um, the X-Men was like my, my real, it picked my interest first. And I then in school uh, had art classes starting in elementary school. And if I remember correctly, I was at Lockhart Elementary that was in my neighborhood in the third ward uh, in Houston. And eventually, um, believe it or not, I actually moved to Los Angeles for about a couple of years when I was, I believe, eight years old. Uh, I continued with um, taking art classes there um, and moved back to Houston uh, afterwards. And I will say like I've, in both at Gregory Lincoln um, Education Center, which was where I had, uh, I went for middle school and also with Michelle Barnes at the Community Artist Collective was where I really began to really think of art, visual art, as a, uh, as a career path or as a possibility as a career path. Um, when I was in high school, uh, starting at, uh, in the year of 1990, I uh, uh, went to the High School for the Performing Visual Arts, or PVA for short, as most people know it to be. Um, I was there as a visual arts student um, and I continued my uh, going to the Community Artists Collective. Um, and I will say while, while I was at PVA, I uh, thought of the idea of taking uh, being a fine artist as I, I really actually took it seriously as that this was a career career possibility. And during um, my junior, I would say maybe sophomore, junior, and senior year, uh, created a group called Blaftco. I read uh, about that. Yeah, tell me. Yes. Blaftco was uh, myself, um, along with uh, Lori Rodriguez, Dao Trong, um, Mario Martinez, and Jimmy Castillo. And we actually uh, got a art studio together uh, at the Midtown Art Center. And I think we paid like $20, $25 uh, a month. And we, you know, we all got uh, rented a space for a month. And then we were there for, I would say maybe six months, maybe up to nine months, I think. And um, we eventually moved to the uh, Multicultural Education and Council to the Arts, or Mecca for short, uh, via Alice Valdez. Mm -hmm. And she gave us a classroom, which was uh, looking onto um, downtown Houston, which uh, out of all of the studio spaces I ever had, that's my absolute favorite one <laughs> in terms of just the view. And just the uh, accessibility to um, arts education um, and seeing an idea go from just from one's uh, head to uh, learning how to uh, write proposals, 
uh, learning how to, you know, also request how much, uh, who's going to be part, who's doing what specifically, um, and then seeing it form into uh, actual um, creation, an actual project. Um, I kind of saw some of that with Michelle. Um, and it was interesting to see it from the perspective of both uh, how Michelle would get things going uh, and created at the collective, and then how it was also done um, in a somewhat larger scale uh, through Alice Valdez at Mecca. Mm -hmm. And so it just was, uh, if I could say I had two artistic mothers, uh, Michelle was the first one. <laughs> And then uh, Alice Valdez uh, was uh, the second uh, mm -hmm. artistic mother um, in terms of uh, learning how to work uh, in an art administration uh, yes. as a whole. So yes, yes, and with a different community, right? With your getting in touch with your Latino roots, you know, Alice yeah. has always been instrumental in making sure that the Latino or Latinx community was engaged in the arts and in traditional art forms as well as contemporary arts and and so right. performance right. art all of that going out right. into the schools. right um so what did left go it, it's b-l-a-f-t-c-o what did that yes. stand for it actually was meant to sound like an industrial uh company <laughs> it does it does and it, it almost <laughs> is innocuous to like what uh you would see in the at the time and this is showing my age a little bit uh what would be in the yellow book a phone book or whatnot um but we just basically took either our first or last names and created mm -hmm. um a fictitious company name that could be somewhat remembered um and the idea was we would work on our projects together um and we initially kind of like really started with, e with e e either doing two things and that was we would curate uh, art projects together and they would be shown at like say Lawndale or at some community center or space in Houston mm -hmm. uh, or um, so anywhere that uh, we would approach um, formally and they, if they would say yes we would be like sure okay we'll do it uh, and we're able to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we eventually did, I would say, most of our projects um, through Mecca. And in fact, I would say about, I would say a little half, a little more than half of our projects was through Mecca and the other half was through other spaces. So when you transitioned into your post-undergrad career, you know, you, you're on the verge of becoming this professional artist and then mm -hmm. how did you make the decision to go back to grad school or to uh you know, what was the time period for you between your undergraduate career and then your transition into the mfa program in baltimore oh i didn't do under i didn't do grad actually oh you uh, didn't do the grad no um new york I city that. new york oh, city okay. was BFA. actually yeah, yeah yeah i just have a bfa yeah yeah, New uh, York was your was your grad school. Yes, your, yeah. your PhD in art, right? Now. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> arts and marketing and self promotion. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say I, I did my undergrad at uh, the Maryland Institute College of Art, uh, Micah for short, in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I must say I loved it there because it was my first real view of seeing a mostly a black city, mm -hmm. um, the hardships and the both the hardships and opportunities that were there. Um, it also just for me uh, as a black gay man, I was able to really understand myself um, as a person, both privately and professionally, in Baltimore. Um, it was close enough to New York. Um, I would take. Uh, weekend trips uh, sometimes, or I would stay like say a few days uh, with friends uh, there. Lordy uh, Rodriguez, who was part of Blathco, he, uh, I believe in his sophomore year, uh, was at SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York. Mm -hmm. So I would crash uh, with him and his family uh, there uh, at times. And 
I would also go to Washington, D.C., which was like 30 minutes, uh, barely, and uh, go to the Smithsonian institutions there and uh, just soak in the, both um, the social and intellectual um, cultures of both D.C., Baltimore, and also uh, New York uh, during my undergrad. And I loved uh, Micah, actually, just the professors that were there. Um, I was challenged um, being in that, being there, being in Baltimore, actually, uh, getting to, I met some, uh, and still have some great friends uh, that I've made there. Um, and just being at Micah uh, was just a, a great experience uh, for me uh, as, a, as a painter. Um, I think at the time, uh, there were, uh, at that school, it was more uh, like sort of graphic art. Uh, was more sort of pushed on to students to sort of make a career, but I really knew I wanted to be uh, a fine artist, a painter. That really was always my my focus and my vision. So I just continued with that. And uh, when I graduated at, uh, in 1998, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, s I was planning on uh, just taking a year off from school and um, I was going to stay in Baltimore for a year and just figure out what my next uh, step was going to be. I wasn't sure if I was going to move back to Houston uh, and uh, go into grad school either back home in Texas or maybe even in, in New York. But for whatever reason, I was like, I'm going to move to New York. And I did that about three or four months after I graduated from school. And uh, literally, I barely had $200 to my name at the time. And I just had the, the, I made arrangements to uh, live in Brooklyn. Um, I think it was in East New York, East New York uh, area. I got a room in the projects, literally in the projects uh, in East New York. And I moved and I didn't even have a job at the time. I'd somehow I figured out, uh, I would say within the first month, I found a job in Soho. I had a furniture store. And um, I began uh, living the New York art experience uh, uh, in, uh, in 1998. And um, it was the roughest ye first year in New York. Um, and I was this close to leaving. And oddly enough, I would say after uh, the first year ended, just doors began to open. I began to uh, exhibit a bit more, um, and I was able to really uh, plant my feet in New York and uh, eventually just ended up staying. Mm -hmm. So now you're in New Jersey. I'm in Jersey City. I live in Jersey City. Uh -huh. um, I have my art studio in downtown Newark, New Jersey. Uh, at uh, Project for Empty Space, which I've been with them for about seven years, I believe, already. Um, and I think what I appreciate about like being here is that it's very similar to me as, uh, uh, as the collective and also Mecca. Uh, spaces that support artists, uh, give artists, uh, special visual artists opportunities to thrive uh, here at Project for Empty Spaces, they have uh, not only uh, where you can rent studios, but they have also an artist in residence program. Um, and also they have a rotating uh, uh, calendar in which they uh, show artists from not only the uh, New Jersey, New York region, but also uh, they show uh, both national and international artists uh, through this program. So um, I just, I, I love it here because it's um, only literally a block away from my day job, uh, the Gateway Center here in downtown Newark uh, at, at the McCarter and English uh, law firm, um, which I'm in their hospitality department. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is to be able to keep the lights on and keep a roof over my, uh, a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it also is the prices uh, in terms of the studio spaces uh, is good enough in which I can comfortably 
you know, rent, uh, uh, pay the studio, uh, uh, pay for my studio space here, and just uh, be able to continue uh, showing uh, my work both here in the New York area as well as uh, now back home in Houston, mm -hmm. which I've been able to, uh, I think I, I started showing my work again in 2014 and just, just have continued uh, since then, uh, at least once or twice a year, mm -hmm. uh, showing back home in Houston. That's awesome. I'm, I, um, as I shared with Nathaniel, don't they? Uh, I had aspirations of being a studio artist when I finished from University of Texas in fine arts and, uh, you know, thought that I too would be in New York. And, um, and I did not have as much stick to it this as you <laughs> have, thankfully, as you have. It's, you figure it out, but I'm sure as being a professor, you figure it out okay. as you just do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. um, well, your talent and your your ability to, I guess, um, in in a couple of the interviews that I read, and certainly I've looked at your at the video of "To Be Continued." Um, I want to talk a little bit about that. You you mentioned how, and maybe it's through these conversations that you've had with yourself over time, not just about you know what the work wants to be, but who you are as an artist, and in that in those series of conversations where you've been very honest and open with yourself, um, you've managed to produce this body of work that is so diverse and yet has this spirit that, um, that candidly presents humanity. You know, all of your subjects are uh, very exposed, you know, if not unclothed, that's not necessarily what I mean, but just mm -hmm. they look vulnerable. The subjects look human. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what I think this larger project is about, right? How the artists are able to see into the human spirit. Um, you said something about how some of your subjects have no idea how you were able to see them so differently yeah. than they see themselves, right? And so if you could speak maybe to uh, some of the work that you think maybe we can load up the the PowerPoint presentation, you can speak to those pieces or to any that you feel particularly proud of or, you know, that, that represent the trajectory of your, of your work now. Um, I, I would say for uh, any body of work I have developed uh, for the past, especially 20 years, uh, past 20 years, yeah. Um, it's either I find Im images online that I are aligned with where my my thinking is at the time, or I find people uh, through life, um, and I just approach them and and I ask, uh, would you be interested in posing for me? And I take uh, ph photographs of them, and uh, the conversations usually are uh, with them. Uh, you see this in me, and I'm like, yeah. Uh, some would call it the artistic eye or whatnot. I mean, for me. I, I see something special and I may see something special in someone and uh, and just go from there. Um, and luckily they trust me enough to um, uh, allow me to uh, do whatever uh, or show them in, in the way in which I, uh, I, I may see them. Uh, but ultimately the piece itself um, tells me what to do uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the image, and I just I, I just go from there. So, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, these are I some of the images. That, oh, go ahead. No, I thought we went dark for a moment. <laughs> I was hoping we were still uh, continuing, but I, I, mm -hmm. I see the uh, I see one of my paintings here. Yeah, we're here. Um, okay. So this is one of the images that you sent. Let me see if I can. Make it. Uh, I, I converted some of your images to slide share or, or transferred them, and okay. this is not necessarily my forte. I'm more of a PowerPoint girl, but 
I think people will get the, the gist of it. Um, do you want to yeah. speak to some of these pieces? So this one, uh, which is uh, called The Man is Lifetime, uh, this piece is really special to me. It was painted, I would say, I think in 2012. So roughly eight years ago. Um, and at this point uh, in my work, I was returning to working uh, technically with acrylic and mixed media collage. So this was the first large painting I did uh, a full length uh, of a full length figure. And it was a challenge for me at the time because I was just sort of staying uh, with working relatively small a scale. Um, and at that time, I didn't even have a studio space. I just was, uh, like I was living in Georgia City uh, at the time in, uh, I think in the West Side area. And I was renting a room at the time. And that was both my room and my studio. Mm -hmm. And luckily, my a landlady at the time, uh, Miss uh, Azima Ross, I would always call her Miss Ross <laughs> uh, for short. And she literally put a, a large piece of wood uh, in one uh, part of the room so that I could just paint. And I was able to uh, produce some of the most uh, for me, uh, special revelatory works uh, that helped steer my career to where is at, where it is at now. And so, um, this painting, um, I wanted to put. Uh, it's I think the figure is from a an, a fashion ad actually, and it's a man that's uh, dressed in a suit, looking away from the viewer. And um, I put the figure of the, of the man first uh, when I started the painting. And the, the very next day, the thought came to me uh, to put a monkey right alongside him. And um, luckily, I had a great illustration of a monkey. He's, uh, the monkey is holding an apple and a spoon. And it looks like the, he is tapping the spoon on top of the apple. And as the painting was continuing to progress, I thought to put different years uh, attached to the uh, to to this pair. Uh, so uh, some of them are like uh, it's, I think there's 1865, which is the uh, end of the Civil War, uh, and 1670, which is I think the disputed year in which um, slavery started uh, here mm -hmm. in the Americas. Yes. Um, on top Formally. of the, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, on top of the man's head is 2008 when uh, uh, President Obama uh, was the first, uh, what is it, um, African American president, of course, uh, won the election that year. Mm -hmm. um, 1994 is actually the year I graduated from HSPVA, so sort of a personal year. Uh, 2001 was, of course, September 11th, and 1976 is actually the year I was born. Um, and 2001 is, of course, 9-11, and 1963 is the year, uh, I believe, JFK became president of the United States. So mm -hmm. the years are both personal and um, particular years of uh, here in America that were special for, uh, I would say, African Americans and just socially mm -hmm. um, as well. So, and also just for me, it was just a painting in which I was able to, I feel, uh, figure out how to work both with text and with image um, at the same time and just pose questions to the viewer, um, to, uh, to them. Um, so uh, it was a very, for me, special painting um, in terms of figuring out how to uh, create, uh, you know, a relationship between the viewer and the work. And I felt like this was one of the first like really strong uh, paintings I was able to really create that really for me uh, really 16 hours. poses uh, 
what is it, um, thought and image uh, for, to the viewer? It, it is absolutely strong. And the, your, your process, um, what, I, what I really enjoy doing is looking at, uh, especially with paintings, is looking at the author's strokes, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not being distracted by the strokes, but looking at that as a thumbprint. Right, mm -hmm. and, and seeing the process that the artist engaged in as um, as equally important as the final product. Yes. If not more so for me, because it, it tells me more about who the artist is. And, um, you know, as I'm looking at this image, I, I see that someone has purchased this particular work. And I'm wondering, you know, when the product is removed from your studio or when it's, I'm sorry, when it is purchased mm -hmm. by someone, especially an image is as potentially uh, incendiary, you know, or if, if, if a, a, a black man had not painted this, let's say that the artist had been non-black, um, the images may have meant something completely different, right? Um, or might have been read a different way. So the juxtaposition of the pr the primate with the black man, you know, mm -hmm. is challenging to a certain extent. And I'm wondering what, one, does it matter to you that other people who see this in Mr. McKenzie's collection read it in a way that you had not anticipated? For example, they might think that this is a some kind of illustration of um, origin of the species, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, some earlier notion about evolution as opposed to you know your personal rendering mm -hmm. i don't know how, how do you feel about that and separating the art from your studio into a place where it might not be read the way you intended um i one thing i've always uh wanted to do just in general no matter uh, what time period i was uh in my own uh, career is I love for the viewer to have their own conversation uh, or understanding a connection to uh, my work. So uh, when I did this painting, uh, what's special about this painting is that it's in the collection of a of a, another black person. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, uh, Rodney McKenzie actually is someone I've worked with uh, before. Um, and when he saw this painting, he immediately uh, made his, his own uh, connections to it uh, conceptually. And um, he just really adores the piece. Um, mm -hmm. And being that I, I believe he's, um, he lives back and forth between New York and Washington, DC. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, this painting is currently in, D in, D in his DC apartment. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe, uh, maybe it's here in New York, I'm not sure, but no matter what, um, sometimes we have conversations about who has seen the piece and some of the convers you know, some of the interesting conversations he's had with people that, you know, has been in his space and have seen the work, this particular mm -hmm. painting and what they've thought in this, that, and the other. And, um, I, I'm always intrigued with how people make their own, their own uh, different connections or the, the, the different narratives they may come up with. Um, and I feel like their connection, their own specific connections are just as uh, important, if not more intriguing than the ones I make with uh, the paintings. Um, and I really try my best to not have a specific story mm -hmm. uh, with any of the pieces I make. I, I, I believe that for me, painting is poetry. And the same as how someone will read a poem and uh, they make their own, you know, special connection to that poem. You know, it's the same with my own uh, images, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, I, I, really I like, important. go ahead, I'm sorry. 
No, that's a really important point. It, it is. Uh, and I, I think it speaks to this, um, what needs to happen within the very uh, hostile social context in which we now live, mm -hmm. wherein the image of the Black man, the image of the Black female body mm -hmm is already always read instantaneously, right? That narrative is fixed, immobile. Mm -hmm. And when, if each of our lives is a text of painting, then how can Black artists change or make people pause before they read any particular text, whether that's a painting or a body, a mm -hmm. situation? You know, and I think that just having that kind of ability, to, this is why Black artists to me matter, right? This is being able to, sure, all art matters, all artists matter, but if the Black artist's voice is not heard, if Black artists' bodies are not visible, we are less capable as humans to perceive the different narratives. Yeah. that uh the occupy space you know narratives that exist in the world and so I, I love the connection that you made there um and the idea that you don't want your your paintings to have a fixed narrative i think that's mm -hmm. that's really important yeah I, I i believe in putting there was a, a point um i would say uh i was struggling uh with algebra in seventh grade and uh, I actually had a black female um, teacher at the time who she was very patient with me and she really I don't think I ever mastered algebra but she one thing that in that class I I felt was significant for me in terms of how I approach painting was she explained to me that with algebra as with all math is that all of the formula is there. Um, all of the elements to figure it out are there. Um, and she always re reiterated that, reiterated that to me. And so um, I always think of my images in the same way I do, I did when I was figuring out al algebra um, in seventh grade. And that is, the formula is there. It's really up to the audience to figure out what their that narrative is going to be for them. And they just figure out what the painting is going to be or the drawing or whatever the piece is. They have they figure out what that that the image is for them mm -hmm. specifically. And um for me, um nothing I do is ever fixed in one particular idea. You know, and I think with math, math is, I would say, very fixed in a formula, but uh, in art, um, it's almost, in, for me, to me, it follows the same rule. Um, and that is all of the formula is there and the audience is there to take all of the visual cues that are there and then come up with what the piece is, what, what it means for them. La Gaia El Sol, orange lady. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she, she came a, a few years later um, in a different series that was uh, from uh, I think a, a show I did called The Mythic Poetic. And what I did was I was I was always intrigued with Greek mythology, mm -hmm. and um, so she is uh, basically Hera, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hera, Zeus's daughter. What's that? Zeus's daughter. Is that uh, mm -hmm. Hera? Is was Zeus's wife? His uh, wife. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. but in in this version, she's you know. Uh, Mother Earth, uh, mm -hmm. but um, just a very interesting version of what Mother Earth is and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it's not as specific, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like 
it, it's whatever you know one wants to uh, make of her. Uh, so uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she is the uh, images from the 19th century, and it is the woman is i'm not sure what culture specifically she's from i just know that she's was just absolutely beautiful the hair is literally these uh the hair is just was the first thing i noticed and the the just the the pose um I think the pose is just from a, a, a few sources, and um, it just the the, the dress uh, is from the nineteenth century as well. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember exactly uh, what culture it's from. It's probably European in some uh, some some form. But one thing that I like to do is just mix things. All, uh, all the time from a variety of source, uh, from a vari variety of cultures, time periods, this, that, and the other. So, you know, and along, the, you know, I just sort of, I, I make things up, you know, and. The, the, the neckline is definitely more revealing than most 19th uh -huh. century, True. you know, her dress would have been, <laughs> but she's not, she, she's definitely still modest you know this is this is uh this image although indicative of the woman's femininity perhaps or her her, her womanhood mm -hmm. it is not hypersexual you know she's not presented in a in a way that would cast her as someone who is you know fixed in her sexual abilities which is very different from contemporary <laughs> a lot of the contemporary yeah. media representations yeah. that we see it, it's 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 the colors are amazingly vivid i see uh, an element of collage mm -hmm. there with um you know talk talk to me about the layers and you know there's some things that i see when i first look at the image and then as i look a little longer i'm able to see into the piece behind the figure that takes center stage um, and there are some some drawings back there, maybe some play with the the paint. Yes. So uh, for me, um, one thing that is um, always needed for me is um, I don't like to say again too much of what the painting is supposed to be. Um, I just put all of the elements uh, together uh, visually and the audience makes up their own narrative in connection to the work. I just, uh, for, for her specifically, the expression that, that she has, um, I, I, as I was developing this painting, I, I think it was a gold background and eventually became a sort of an orange, reddish orange background. Of, and the bananas that are above her head uh, sort of came almost at the last moment. Mm -hmm. It was a decision that I wasn't even really sure that of what that was going to be. I just know that I wanted her to be regal in, in some way. And that did happen. Um, but I just, you know, I think especially as the painting was beginning to come to, you know, you know, its end, it still doesn't have a, a specific story per se. It doesn't really say this is, or this is, th this is, or this is that. Mm -hmm. It's just, I feel for me, a very regal portrait of a, of a black woman. I would agree. And um, because I think just the image of the woman uh, that of what she is, as I saw her from um, again, she's a she's from the 19th century, probably you know the late 18, maybe 50s, 60s, or what so have you. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. She just was very intriguing. I, I forget um, exactly what specific culture she's from. Um, but she just, she was, she was just very captivating to me in the, the hair and the, just the expression, everything just was enough for me to, you know, mm -hmm. create this piece and uh, let the viewer make whatever, you know, narrative or story they wish to make of her. Mm -hmm. So, I think it is beautiful that that one word, the descriptor you used, regal, and and that is true. Again, it runs counter to so many of the images that we see in the contemporary media space and the popular cultural space. Yeah. Um, that wherein a lot of the performing artists, uh, music artists, who are vying for that space as artists, um, visual and music artists, um, show themselves in a way that. I think they that they aspire for a, a regal position or a position of prominence within their respective industries, but mm -hmm. there's a stillness and a, and a not trying, uh, the, the affect of not trying, but just being that is, um, that's really, it's quiet and still and, and regal. As you said, is this a tarot, tarot card in the back here? Yes. Um, um, now at, there is, um, for Mexico, um, there is, I'm trying to remember, there are playing cards. Um, mm -hmm. Like bingo or something. Yes, and mm -hmm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to remember. Um, La Luz? No, yeah. or, no, that's the moon, but there's a game that I used to play when we were younger that mm. had these, I know exactly what you're talking about, I, I do. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to remember exactly uh, what the, the mm -hmm. name of the you know the name of the game or what or what to have you but they're essentially mexico uh, uh tarot cards mm -hmm. and um i i knew that when i was creating this series um that when i i wanted those cards to be not necessarily um, that they had to be specifically about what the uh, the character is or what so have you, but mm -hmm. I just for me it's I just knew that the um, tarot cards helped sort of somewhat somewhat a guide or accent what the piece was about. L so. Loteria. Loteria cards, yes. Okay. okay. That's okay. it, yes. Okay. And, yes. and it's Luna yeah. is moon, but I know there was one that said La Luz and the guy, yeah. El Gallo, El, you know, they had these little, I remember playing that in elementary. Yeah. But yeah, um, really, really interesting, beautiful pieces. Yeah. I was really trying to remember exactly, um, you know, and there are some others, yeah, yeah. in the back. Uh, so this was really interesting to me, and I'll tell you why. Um, I started watching Beyonce's Black is King, mm -hmm. and in that film, there is a figure, a blue figure, that's wandering around, right? Um, and there's no context for this figure, but it reminded me of the Vishnu, um, uh, the images of Vishnu. Um, that I've, I had seen in the past. And so when I came across this Rashid as Parashurama, I thought, oh, okay, well, he's not a blue figure, but he's part of that Hindu sensibility or that religious um, ideology or, you know, concepts. And so I'm just, I'm really interested to know who is Rashid and what was the inspiration for this piece? Um, well, Rashid is actually a, uh, someone that I know. Um, he at first worked at a Dunkin' Donuts uh, close to my day job, eventually became a uh, security guard, all within the, uh, close to where my day job was. And he just was just a, a different, a, an interesting, he has an interesting look. And uh, eventually, and almost every day, you know, I would either, you know, get 
coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. And I just, you know, in our different co conversations, you know, I asked him one day, like, would you mind uh, posing for, uh, you know, a painting? And I always expect the person to say no, actually. Really? <laughs> and he, yeah, and he said yes. And it was, you know, and as we were figuring out, uh, the, you know, time and scheduling and this and the other, I, I felt the, how I would, how my approach to him was going to be, the approach was very natural. It wasn't, um, wasn't uh, awkward and it wasn't like, oh, it's specifically about this or specifically that. I just sort of gave him an idea that I wanted, that I wanted to touch on mythology in some way. And he, I think one specific question that he always asked was, why me? And I, and I would always respond, why not you? Mm -hmm. That was sort of always the, uh, you know, the question and then the response. Mm -hmm. So in the, they would say, yeah, I took a um, few, fo some photos of him or what to have you. And as I uh, was beginning to go through the series as in terms of who he was going to represent, um, I thought of um, Parashurama, who is a version of Vishnu, mm -hmm. which is the god of life. Mm -hmm. And so Parashurama, if I'm not mistaken, is a, is a warrior um, manifestation of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. I know Vishnu definitely uh, was a warrior in almost every um, manifestation uh, that he had. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but, you know, some uh, manifestations were you know, either it for, um, was, I would say, either about um, peace or it was either about um, destruction or it was about certain aspects of whatnot. I know that there were eight yes. or whatnot, but Parashurama was the warrior god and he did have a... Um, Acts, if I'm not mistaken, which was uh, featured here. So as, you know, I uh, thought of the painting, I, again, it wasn't a specific, like it had to be about any particular thing. It's just, you know, the idea of the painting, I just wanted a warrior of some sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rashid, uh, is Moroccan in terms of his culture. And one thing I always keep in mind, no matter what uh, culture the person is themselves, mm -hmm. I always admired world, the world stage as, cult, as my guide to making my, my work. So no matter what time period I've made my work and no time period of what culture I've that's guided me, whether it's, you know, black culture or, or um, Indian culture, which specifically this really kind of comes from more so, or Mexican culture or Asian culture or European culture, or so have you, I'm more intrigued or I love, so just, having a variety of of thoughts you know all at the same time in what I do so mm -hmm. you um, said that you use a lot of birds and butterflies you know certainly the the, the pigeons are prominent in this painting um yes. and you say that they're uh illustrative of flight or you know uh that they're metaphors for flight is there a specific 
idea, and I know that you don't have any fixed or rigid narratives associated with it, but I'm wondering, you know, typically when people think of flight, like in the books of Toni Morrison, there's always someone flying away from something, you know, not necessarily flying to a destination as yeah. much as fleeing oppression or fleeing persecution or um, discomfort in a way that is uh, oppressive. So is there, a, 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 you know, this metaphor, if you could just kind of talk to us a little bit about the metaphor of flight in this particular piece. Um, in this specific um, portrait, I, when you think of pigeons, they're, they are a nuisance. Um, uh, and that was really the only uh, sort of point that I wanted to make uh, specifically in terms of making this particular um, painting. Mm -hmm. However, you know, oddly enough for me, I don't see necessarily the, the patrons being really more of a annoying, more as they're, they are, they, be, they become sort of a very, this, they just create an interesting tension between uh, Rashid's uh, physical stance with the um, with the uh, apps mm -hmm. um, and the various um, uh, pigeons that are in you know a variety of different uh, stances themselves or what so have you. So um, I know in the you know black community uh, pigeons are. There was a song, I think, uh, about pigeons, and that was a thing that uh, that was what is it uh, was negative in terms of women um, mm -hmm. at the time. I think in the I would say late '90s, there was a song about pigeons or whatnot. No more pigeons or what's so happening. Oh, as a counter to no more scrubs. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. TLC's yeah famous, and then somebody came and wrote yes. Response yeah. to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I kind of thought of it in that, uh, in that dynamic, but that's not necessarily saying this is this has to be, has to be, has to be. Sure. But again, this was uh, when I was thinking of of using pigeons. Pigeons are everywhere in the world, almost in every culture, every community. They're there. And are they annoying? Some people think of them as annoying. Some of them, uh, I know in every culture, they are, one thing that unifies the idea of patrons is that it's an urban, um, it's, an, it's definitely a bird in an urban environment, mm -hmm. almost everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really my only, I would say, um, if there is a context to why the, the pigeon is featured here, is that, the, you know, it sort of gives uh, some element of, or maybe it speaks of ur the urban environment, but it doesn't necessarily say, it, say anything specific, whether it's good or bad. It's just that it's there, you know. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder, in, in retrospect, I wonder if Rashid's being a soldier here has anything to do with his sh shift in occupation. <laughs> you know, he became... you know I, I never thought of that either, you know, and uh, when he eventually saw the painting, um, he never questioned my, my thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. Or he never, uh, he never even wondered why, uh, I post him in this context. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So. Um, it's interesting that I don't read his body as a threat. I read his body as a protector. I mm -hmm. mean, even when you would go into Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, he was your protector of the day, fueling you with, <laughs> arming was, you with coffee. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was more, you know. <laughs> yeah, I really interesting. There was a particular, um, drink he always uh made for me probably had way too much sugar in it but <laughs> you know it was uh i definitely he 
I would always say, make it uh, something that would keep me going for the day. And, but in this painting, uh, you know, it, it, again, you know, what is it about specifically? Not really sure, but it mm -hmm. doesn't, that part doesn't really matter. You know, there's mm -hmm. so much visually that's here. There is, yes. there is, there is him. Then there is the, uh, the ax that he's holding. You're not sure if he's threatening these uh, these birds. There's also the uh, if you see that's around him. There's a there is a, a couple of um, lotaria cards. Uh, one of them is of what appears to be a um, a soldier, an El, El Soldado uh, soldier uh, tarot card, and then there's another one. Um, I think it's called uh, La Rania, mm -hmm. and that a is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a spider. And I know, I'm not even sure what that represents. I, I just know that visually it made sense. So as I, you know, was thinking of this painting, I just, or with anything that I do, if it feels right, it goes in the painting. If it doesn't make any sense for the painting, then I won't put it in the painting. Mm -hmm. So for me, what you know, about the instinct to put the Monopoly guy in there? <laughs> um, yeah, um, he he actually was one of the last elements in the painting. Uh, one of the last things I put when I was um, developing this piece, um, and. I still really don't know what the Monopoly guy really exactly means. I just know he he does make sense uh, in uh, in terms of the context of the of the image and what it's, what it may be saying. But I want uh, you know for each viewer, they're gonna have their own thoughts of what you know this is. You know, it could be about Rashid, it could be about someone else. It could be about them, them, the viewer specifically, you know, so. I love it. I love that. Okay, we're going to get through a couple of these. Um, this one is a, certainly, viewers will see this as more obviously um, mm -hmm. invested in what we might consider a social justice issue, you know, yeah. a the social justice issue with which we're all kind of dealing right now particularly in America, but certainly internationally. Mm -hmm. Talk to Presumed Innocent, what's going on here? So Presumed Innocent is from a, a, a current series of, of men of color um, that have been de in development, um, or rather making or what so have you. And uh, it's actually one of the smallest pieces uh, in, you know, the, you know, in terms of size, because I usually uh, either work really large or I would say it's sort of moderate in size, but this is a really small painting. It's only 11 by 14 inches. So it's really, really small and it's not really a lot of room to work with. So um, as I was developing it, I, I painted the, the figure is I would say I'm, I'm probably a fashion ad. It was a very dark skinned uh, black male. And the, the arms, if you see it, are from a police officer from the, if I'm not mistaken, it's from a raid uh, from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the, the arms and the hands that are there definitely speak of you know a threat and tension between you know the uh portrait of the young man that's here and as you can, as we all know what's been going on socially right now the the aspect of you know threats you know with black men of just black people in general and how a lot of them die unnecessarily or whatnot 
it was, it is and was for me the reason why I made the painting. I, I wanted to make, you know, that, that needed to be, you know, or has to be the conversation. You know, I wanted that to be, you know, mm -hmm. why this, I wanted that to be um, why this painting was made and, mm -hmm. and needed to be the conversation and it needed to also be, you know, a, the point made to the viewer that this is wrong. This is something that's wrong. You know, it's something wrong in terms of how, you know, black men are always thought of as a negative element or it's always, you know, and we are seen negatively, you know. So um, I, again, with the, um, What's interesting is that it's, a, I think it's from a fashion ad, oddly enough. And, but here, you know, it's used, you know, everything is sort of, uh, again, curated, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. one context to a, to another, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and me, in the media, media, uh, things are spliced all the time. Yeah. you know, elements are spliced all the time, so. To create the perception and to get yes. the reception that's intended, right. absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's eerie. And I think it's interesting that the issue is so large and yet it, the idea around the issue can be compressed into such a small space and still take up a lot of psychological space you know yep. this is this is this idea is driving a lot of Americans understanding about what it is to be in America these days and yet it didn't take a huge portrait for you to mm -hmm. yeah you know, discuss it I think that's really interesting yeah um I the the uh the gentleman who bought the painting recently he's a white english man um he's a friend of mine his name is neil gray and um, he's retired and he we have discussions about this painting all the time and this painting is just it always intrigues him and we always have a variety of you know for him you know he one thing that always is intriguing to him is the um, what he calls flies that are around uh, his head. Same thing, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet, uh, they are, uh, if I'm not mis, they are just, um, they're like from a uh, paper, they're from a paper tile design. And I just made them, they look like to me uh, swarms of insects. Mm -hmm. I was so, thinking the exact same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's interesting. He saw it in that way. I definitely see it in that way too. Mm -hmm. um, but exactly what does that mean? You know, um, yeah. it's, I see it as like, this is something, it's a universal truth or it's a universal uh, element. You know, it's a universal, you know, thing or whatnot. <clears throat> so, you know, it's interesting how two people, uh, two different backgrounds see that same exact thing and whatnot, or make that same, make that same connection, so. And this is part of, from your series to be continued, right? Yes. I think you shared a couple of slides, a couple yes. of images from that show. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about this. I think we have about two additional slides after this one. So this one is called Seven. And uh, the only reason why it's called Seven is because uh, there are seven uh, slashes of color that's around the figure. Um, and the young man, uh, his name is Andre, um, is the model for the painting. And this is for me, I would say, 
there is just sort of a universal, I, I have a thing with, uh, in terms of any model that I use is I, I want it to be a, usually a universal statement that's made in some sort. And that statement doesn't necessarily need to be ne necessarily bad or good. It needs to just be made, period. So in this case, you know, uh, when he was posting for me, it was just a point of, you know, like what is usually um, in any, with between any artist and the model, you know, making some sort of, uh, class. for in this case, it's a classical, uh, <clears throat> classical, classical, uh, what is it? What is it? Um, pose, per se, mm -hmm. or whatnot. And in this case, it's just a very universally ten tense, almost, um, what is the term? Um, fetus, it's like a, a fetus or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I was going through the poses or whatnot, this pose, I kept going back to this pose and I just was like, this is, this is the painting I really wanna make. So I used it, used it uh, for this painting. And in terms of the painting itself, the birds are just simply uh, the rules of, for artists in terms of, uh, for painters, red, yellow, and blue, which is the primary colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are, so there's a red, yellow, and blue bird that's there. And then there's so many different dense uh, elements that are in the painting around the figure. And you're not, and one is, you know, left with making their own, you know, statements of what, who this person is, what is it about, mm -hmm. what is it saying mm -hmm. specifically or exactly. And to this day, I really don't personally really know what the painting is about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I just feel it. it is a painting that I felt needed to be made and it makes sense conceptually. And um, it ended up being something very beautiful and very unique. Um, I know- I, I, I like that he's there. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just, I, I just know that when I, I showed this, this painting, um, and when it was in the show, um, it was presented earlier this year, people really were very intrigued with, you know, the pose itself and just what it is or what it's, you know, mm -hmm. what it's trying to say or not, or not say, so. Yeah, I, I like that he's there in much the same way that the, the the previous image of Rashid, you know, we don't know what he's doing there. And it's okay not to know. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's okay not to know why the body is there in the middle of this painting. You know, that body is not, um, it doesn't have to be doing anything other than being, you know. Um, and just as a study, it's, it's, I think, as you said before, when I was in art school and we would have different subjects come in and a lot of them would assume these very interesting poses and we would just do studies of them right and that means that we had to see them we had to really look at angle and light and um it wasn't necessarily about creating a realistic representation of the body there but getting the impression you know um capturing an essence or uh, um, some kind of feeling that resonated with us when we looked at the at the subject and i i see it just a being in at ease with it uh communing with nature and i like the I, I love the birds i love your explanation of the birds and the motion he's very still although he he's not uh, you know he's not laying in in one particular way you know his legs aren't 
perpendicular or vertical and his hands aren't by his side. He's very, uh, he's in an interesting shape, but he's still, and the birds add an interesting movement to the piece as well. Yeah. Um, so what about the lines? What about the seven lines? Other than the color dynamic, are they just, you're, you call them something? What did you call uh, them? It's just seven of, it's just seven lines uh, that are there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I really didn't know what to really call the painting, <laughs> but eventually, yeah. Eventually, it it became seven because of the the seven slashes that one that's right above his uh, his wrist mm -hmm. and one part you know, close to his head and then also close to one of his legs and yeah. whatnot yeah. and also it's just intriguing like right now we're we're making the we're we're having the conversation about uh, Mr. Daniel Prude who recently now is in the yes. news. I thought about it, but I wasn't going to say it because I said yeah. I'm too literal with it. But yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's like we, we're we right now having this conversation. And I always, it's always said, you know, art is very related to the times that we live in. And we're, we're have again, we're having that conversation again now, mm -hmm. you know. Amazing. Amazing parallel. Yeah. All right. I think this is our last slide. Woman with a child. Oh yeah, woman with child or composition in yellow and purple. Mm -hmm. And so this is for me um, kind of uh, is an interesting painting because it. I remember I would have conversations with my grandmother, and she was a caretaker when she was alive, and she was. Um, she worked for a um, a white doctor and and his family, and she would uh, just tell me about the family and of whatnot and why she, you know, had to do this and this and the other. And so you know, it's a conversation about race, but you know, for her, she never spoke about race in a necessarily negative per se, a negative uh, aspect per se, it just was, mm -hmm. it just was so, you know, it just was part of how it is and how it, how it, was, how it was. And so, you know, when I did this painting, I, I always want to talk about race in a I want, I don't want to make it too much about, you know, it's about this, you know, I, I want to talk about race, but I also don't want to talk about it at the same time. You know, I just need to be, you know, part of the conversation, mm -hmm. but it also, you know, it should be something that, you know, mm -hmm doesn't necessarily have to always, you know, I just, I wanted to make a beautiful painting <laughs> too, you know, that's, that's a, another thing too. And that's something in terms of when I'm making art, I think about that. A lot of your paintings feature colors um, and imagery, even the dress, and this is the second woman that I'm seeing just in a way that reminds me of Caribbean or um, you know, Afro-Caribbean lineage, um, tradition, culture. And I'm wondering, I, I know that your, your father's from Panama, um, yes. but I, how much of that, the experience of the diaspora, particularly from that Latino country, is a conscious part of your work or do you set out to intentionally include or is that just part of your DNA as an artist? You know, it just happens that you um, you work in what looks to be or what could be associated with your Afro-Caribbean Latino. It just seems to always, is it's just always there. And I don't even try to have it, you know, part of the conversation or whatnot, but it is, you know, maybe I'm going through some uh, 
some uh, cultural, uh, trying to figure out things culture within myself could be, who knows. But um, I just, I, I just know when I made this painting, it it made sense uh, visually, and um, it's it's definitely a very very beautiful piece. I it feel is. Um, I I think it's from the um, it's from the review series I did on a woman that was at the Community Arts Collective a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. or whatnot and it's it was it it just is a you know to me a very simple uh simple p uh, portrait of two uh individuals yet there's so much tension that is in it mm -hmm. so mm, very interesting yeah. Well, I am, I'm, I'm so grateful for the time that you've given me today, and I'm hoping that the viewers will see, um, not just in this presentation, but also in the panel that we have next month, mm -hmm. why it is that Black art is so important and how Black art matters, uh, arts and education matter. Are there any words that you want to share about where you're showing next or um, maybe what you see as the direction of your work in the, in the near future? Well, right now I am working on a project called We the People. It's an online show about voting and getting people uh, inspired to go out and vote. It is so important, people, everyone, please go out and vote. November 3rd, 2020, no matter who you're voting for, just go out and vote. I mean, I'm voting for Biden and Harris, of course. But, you know, I mean- We'll talk about why the of course in the panel discussion. But, yeah, but I, I just feel like, uh, I just feel like, you know, Americans don't take the, that, they don't exercise that enough. They, you know, and I, I, I want us to, you know, definitely in this next, you know, show, and this, this project, I want I would I want us to really take this seriously. And this is also, you know, there's also the show 2020 that's coming up, and it's just talking about, you know, what's going on right now. Like the painting we're behind me, um, the one there's a painting of George Floyd and his family and whatnot, and that's going to be at the collective, or to have you. So, you know. Okay. That this is what's what's in my um, vocabulary. This is what what's in my thought process and vocabulary right now. So yeah, yeah, I, I I really appreciate your work and the time. If you would give me, as you're able, supply me with the uh, the website to your digital exhibit, and I'll make sure that it gets on the website so that that people can get to it. But we will definitely extend this conversation because I know you have more to say about men of color as human beings and, you know, talking about what it means to be black and male and perhaps black and male and part of the LGBTQ community, if you consider yourself part of that community. Um, um, and just, you know, being able to express yourself freely and as, you know, uninhibited un un as you possibly mm -hmm. can. So I appreciate your time so much. Ricardo it means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benson. This is, uh, I'm so honored to be part of this conversation. I, I feel like that, you know, we need to have these types of forums, you know, all the time, you know, and mm -hmm. so thank you for having me part of yours. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you you're the one who can stop recording since I can't stop. Okay, <laughs> stop recording. Ricardo, you were awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. This is gonna be great. I'm serious. Oh, no problem. No problem. I was talking to Nate about the fact that um, that maybe in December. When are you showing the 2020 show? The 2020 show is in January, um, at the collective. Now, in terms of the exact date. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's 
the la later part of the of the month of January. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying um, to come up with a date for artists homecoming at the collective. You know, there hasn't been a an opportunity really for so many of the artists who have been ex either exhibited or you know taught workshops or just been in any way affiliated to come through and and just kind of reconnect you know mm. and um, I'm, I'm really grateful to you just on a personal note for continuing to show your support by exhibiting at the collective as you know mommy has given her life's blood and I, I don't think that uh, certain municipal organizations have treated her well mm. uh, I think that they have appropriated a lot of what she has been trying to do because they see the good in it and they're trying to get it for themselves you know how that goes and so yeah. I can't fault them but at the same time I really it, it just means a lot that so many artists value the collective and I want her to sense that you know I really mm. want her to know that so Maybe around the time that you do your exhibition, we can do some huge thing where it's the Ricardo 2020 show. And then it's, <laughs> you know, all other artists come back and see Mr. Francis' show and, you know, right. say hello to the collective, something like that. So that's cool. Well, good luck to you. Let me know if I can help in any way, if you need anything. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me part of your project and part of this conversation. And I cannot wait to, uh, have uh, continue with this with you and see the other aspects and other people that you have and the other different conversations that you that you're that you're having in this project this is needed this is needed right now all of what's happening around this is, is needed right now so i'm just glad to, i'm very honored to be part of this project and, our, and part of this this process that we're having right now so thank you okay. all right i'll send you an email thanks so okay. much Okay. Bye. Bye.